Hey, everybody, this is P. Day Turner, executive producer and host of The Break It Down Show, bringing you today's episode, continuing our conversations on the SFAB topic, the Military Advisor Training Academy or the Security Forces Advisor Brigade Warriors, and trying to help them put together things that will guide them elementally towards what it means to be a good advisor. Today is... If you've listened to the show for any length of time, you guys know I love Rich Liday. We've done a lot of writing and work together in crazy, crazy places, and he's been on the show any number of times. Go to the guest tab on breakitdownshow.com and just look at Rich Liday and just mash the button, and you know you're going to find great stuff. Plus, also his episode with Dave Daly, and he does a lot with us. So, I think what you're going to find out with Rich is he's going to promote education. He doesn't just mean education specific, like you need a BS or a BA. He's talking specifically about advisors and how to get smart, you know, understanding a regional uh, study base or how to look at how power flows as a, as a political scientist, but also coupling in other soft sciences like sociology and understanding culture. Those kind of things are what he's talking about when he says, get an education in this, whether you get a minor from Troy as he promotes, or you just grab books like Robin Drink's book on trust and you learn that, or you grab Benedict A. Grima's book on ethnography of the Pashtun ladies. These are the books that give you the mindset that you need to go out and partner well. And that's what he's trying to get at here. This is a powerful, powerful episode. Hey, if you love what we do, if you want more content like this, I certainly have it available. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. I will point you towards episodes that are on theme with this. There's a lot of stuff out there on partnering, on cross-cultural work. It's not something that we only do. Obviously, we talk about a lot of things here. The show is designed to be a wide array. But this week, we are focused on these combat advisors and how to to get them to the peak of what they need to do because their job is extraordinarily delicate. It takes deliberate attention and it is maddeningly <laughs> driven by errors and instability. So you have to work your way through that and we're trying to help map that out. So if you're in the SFAB world or you're a commander of some kind and you want some advice, glad to put you in contact with any of the people you're talking, you're hearing from this week. And if you're from the civilian world and you're like, hey, we can use some of this good culture medicine, let me know. I can get you in contact with all of these guys. Here comes our guy from Troy University, the incredible Dr. Richard Lede. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copa. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Dr. Rich Lede, and you are listening to The Break It Down Show. So Dr. Rich and I were research partners in the field in Afghanistan, and it was a, a nice culmination for each of us. Uh, I had spent a lot of time in a lot of districts and provinces in Iraq, and I had built a system that I knew was reliable. And when I came to Afghanistan, I, would, I now, after validating it through several units, I wanted to take it to a totally different place. You know, granted, same theater, but totally different fight in terms of Afghanistan versus Iraq. And the last piece that I needed that I didn't have real access to was the academic side. Uh, Rich, Rich is uh, a PhD from Notre Dame, but also importantly for all of those folks listening on the SFAB side, he's a former 11 Bravo. So his distinct knowledge is not only academic, but also this powerful steeping in, in the world of infantry. And I should say, too, in general, this is part of our series of shows that are, we're working on the SFABs, and I'm hoping to get a fifth conversation. But even if I don't get that conversation, because there's a couple of scheduling problems I'm dealing with, these conversations are meant to provide the elements for someone who's going to be an advisor to someone, to, to a person working in a foreign country. The importance of this is that we actually know shit do this as a military. We try to advise the militaries. And so if you're in the audience and you're not part of the SFAB, here's why you're listening to this. You're learning how to partner with someone across cultural, across religion, across language, across national. You know, there's a lot of, of usefulness in collaboration with entities who aren't you, who don't necessarily have aligned goals with you. And how do we do this? And so Rich is going to talk specifically about the mindsets that you need to have as an elemental approach, like what at a basic level, what comprises a good advisor. And so Rich is going to talk about this from an academics point of view. So I did a little bit of Rich's background. If you guys don't know Rich, there's several episodes that we've done with him. He's a political scientist. He works at Troy U. He is a dear, dear, dear friend of mine and someone who, you know, we have put our trust in each other on the battlefield. 
And uh, and that already is a significant thing just to say that, you know, as part of our bona fides. We know each other well. So when you hear these lessons, these lessons are born from his work, my work, and how we've collaborated the last like six plus years on trying to develop our, our thoughts into a system that works and it does. So well all of that said, my old my whole preamble's over now. Rich, let's talk about your topic. Well thanks for that, man. That makes me feel real good. Thanks for uh, starting me out on a high note. You could have just bashed the shit out of me the whole time. <laughs> uh, no, I don't know, man. I was having a hard time thinking about how to have this conversation because I really don't know how to present this information in a typical academic research paper style. And since we're going, uh, I'm, I'm going to be participating, you're going to be participating in a symposium down at Auburn University for the um, advisor, for the advisor training academy. I like to write a paper. If I'm going to go to a conference, I like to write a paper. So I'm trying to write a paper on some of the, uh, what I see is some of the attributes that the advisor needs, but I couldn't figure out how to write it because I'm not really good at writing things that don't involve a lot of numbers. Yeah. I'm just going to make an argument and I'm going to speak from my own experience on this thing, but I still have a lot of questions, you know, questions that I'm asking myself, but it's really a, just going to be a reflection essay, I think, you know, so maybe people in the audience uh, can help me figure out how to add to this and turn it into a little bit more of an academic an academic paper but for right now it's just really a reflection piece um, mm -hmm. but what I try to do is develop a series of skills or attributes that the advisor needs to have a better sense a better better sense of their uh, situational awareness if you will okay well, how does someone, okay, so what's the standard right now? Like, what, what is your impression from what you've seen? Uh, where, where are we at? Like, how, what's the mindset if, if, uh, if it's got to be a different one? Well, right now I'm taking a purely, I'm looking at this as an, um, trying to, trying to look at it from an academic perspective, looking at the warrior side of the mission okay. instead of the warrior side, looking at the academics portion of the mission, you know? So the title of the paper so far, the working title, always got a working title um, and remind myself that it is a working title, but creating a modern warrior scholar. Okay. Views on the application of academic training research into the contemporary training cycle. Now, did they, do any of those words uh, resonate with you? Peter? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the modern warrior, you had me right there because here's the deal with the modern warrior. Uh, often not found in a tank, though he is or she is a tanker, often ill-prepared for the battlefield because they went to NTC and they fired their artillery piece instead of working on controlling conversations. The modern warrior has more elements and facets to to fight in the modern fight than, than ever before. You can be a combatant who engages with a partner and never, in an entire deployment, never has any direct contact with the enemy. And yet you are absolutely a combat warrior. So you're fighting socially, culturally, politically, economically, by, with, and through religion, and of course, militarily. You know, those are all things that you have to account for. So the, when you say the modern warrior right there, just stopping at that point and saying, you need to have mastery of all these topics. And then the reading list for each of those topics is what, 25 books long each? So just to put the facts into your head and now develop your own personal training because there's not individual training systems created that can reliably create organizational outcomes that are intended well but there are such uh there are some skills that can be achieved in the classroom well yes right <laughs> yes there's some skills that we can achieve in the classroom or in the classroom setting and that is really the main reason i'm making this argument okay because i have been involved in an academic mission, if you will, of my own, you know, my own personal journey. I've been pursuing an academic career. I'm in an academic career. I've been working towards an academic career. I've been doing this for 20 years and I still don't feel like I'm good at it. Um, but I think I'm getting better. Right. And that's the kind of perspective. Now, when I deployed, I hadn't been doing this for 20 years. 
uh, when I deployed as a combat advisor, when we worked together. But I was easily a good 11, 12 years deep into this. But I had a different skill set. I was, I, was I was trained as an infantryman when I was in, in my younger days, right? But it was a lot of time spent in the classroom and not just specifically in the classroom learning about Afghanistan, but just learning how to think, right? Learning how to think in a systematic way about really, really complex problems. Okay. Because that's what my training as a political scientist has done for me. And that's what academic coursework, I think, can, I think that's what the modern warrior scholar, um, that's why I, that's why I throw scholar in there, because I think if you're going to be a modern warrior, you got to have a certain level of scholarship, right? Especially if you're going to be a combat advisor, a member of a security of the security force assistance brigades team. Let me, let me jump in here and, and ask a question for the audience. I'm already a combat scholar. I've got a degree. I probably have two degrees. I'm working on a degree. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm already a combat scholar. Help me understand what you're saying versus what someone who has a degree already uh, is doing. How is your model different? Well, what I'm doing is, and again, this is all still a work in progress, right? And let me, um, my model's focused again, like I said, on four key. I, I, I don't know if they're skilled. I don't know if they're properly uh categorized as skills or attributes or knowledge sets. Um, but building rapport, there's two, two, two types of building rapport, right? So number one, building rapport, first of all, with the local population. Number two, building rapport in terms of your key leader engagements. And I think you know a little bit about both of those yeah, aspects sure. of rapport right. building. Uh, I believe you've done quite a few shows that, that touch on that theme. Number three, acknowledging the endogenous and exogenous sources of stability and instability. And finally, uh, last but not least, number four, the modern warrior often is asked to facilitate the implementation of development initiatives. Okay. Um, now that might, that might still be a portion of number three, looking at the internal and external sources of stability and instability or being under, being able to understand that, right? Because what I'm arguing is all four of these knowledge, skills, and attributes, um, knowledge, skills, and attributes, I'm arguing that these are what the modern warrior, it's part of what the modern warrior has to do. And you got to do that with an M4. <laughs> Yeah, maybe an M9 too. Uh, yeah. okay, let's start with the first one. Let's break that one down. Well, wait. Oh, okay. Does that resonate with you? Does that make sense? Is that palatable? Right? Let me get your thoughts on this because if I'm going to keep, you know, if I'm going to dig any more time into this paper, I need to know if it's making sense. I got to make <laughs> some adjustments. Are yeah, those okay. four things separate or are those four things, you know, you know, and I know there's more. See, that's what I'm trying to do is I'm trying yeah. to also build the template so someone like you can come behind me and say, I see what he done here with this. Let me see what I could, you know, let me see what I can now do. Well, this is my first passed over him. Give me the four, just the four real quick, and then I'll comment on that. Building rapport, local population. Building rapport, key leader engagement. Acknowledging the endogenous and exogenous sources of stability and instability. Number four, facilitating the implementation of development initiatives. Yes, I, I recognize those. And like you, I want to add things to it. Uh, if you are an advisor in someone else's combat space, or if you're some kind of enabler in someone else's combat space, you also have to build rapport and trust with your host unit. Let's see. Okay, that's another thing. And then the other one was, ah, uh, shit, I lost it. You're right about determining what does create, and let's say most honestly, what are you creating? Are you creating instability or stability? That's like the second law of stability operations. So absolutely, with the first law being you're going to make mistakes, you know, and if you're not making mistakes, you're violating the first law. That's the second law. The third law would be your presence creates instability until you can prove otherwise, and you have to prove that externally. So that's a great template already those four things there was a strong fifth one but the thought escapes me again this is my my first pass into this but that rapport piece is is really important because saying we're going to establish rapport and reliably creating it at an institutional level that doesn't exist 
we just say the words establish rapport. Rapport is measurable. And you should be able to pull your smart card out and say, these are steps that commonly lead to rapport. And here are the KPIs. Here are the key performance indicators that you have it. Just saying, I've talked about my kids. I've asked about their kids. We talked about the weather and now on to business. That is not establishing rapport. And in some cultures, a lot of cultures, you're not even a third of the way into the conversation that needs to happen. You know, you're trying to have a conversation that establishes rapport, and those things are tough to do. So you have to have it with your with your host unit. You have to have it, like you said, with the partner nation and also with the populace when applicable, for sure. So the two types now, you're right, and I didn't write, I did not write on building rapport with the host unit. Yeah. And every unit has its own culture. We know that. Right. Uh, one reason I didn't have a lot of. I remember my I remember my fifth element. What is it? Because I'm right. I'm taking notes. Yeah. You have to think spherically in terms of communication. So your partner's, your your ordinate or subordinate partner relationship, you need to have a command of what's being said because it's too easy to isolate silo and have negative perceptions. You and I have seen this of someone who's in an alternate ministry, someone who's up the chain, someone who's down the chain. If you can't coordinate across your own side, you, you know, captain to colonel on the American side, you will have unnecessary problems because you can't communicate spherically. So you got to be able to go up, down, left, right on that spectrum to be able to properly understand what these things do. Sometimes, Rich, partners and their partner teams, they need to all get together in the same room and hash out bigger things like a wheat seed distro like educational issues, because our needs, their needs, there's a lot of individual nodalities. And if you don't account for that through communication, that's not all cross communication, then, then you're going to struggle to succeed in, in, in another environment. Let me say this another way. Battalion, company, platoon, those things need to communicate smoothly and across partner boundaries. And then also to be able to map out what other partner boundaries are out there that are outside of the military chain. So Ministry of Mining, Ministry of Tourism, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Interior, all those things. You need to be able to say, before we have a negative perception of someone else's partner, and the moment you hear that negative perception, and and you know what I'm going to say now, oh, he's a basket case, you (laughs) need to say, I reject that premise. That requires me to stop what I'm doing and go engage with my, my peer at the ordinate or subordinate level. You know, that's the kind of knowledge that you have to have. I mean, that's that I could tie that into building rapport with the host unit because you got to know what the unit's capable of. You got to know what you're dealing with. You got to expect basket case to come from that person's mouth. You got to expect him to say that, you know, but you also got to know who that person is, what that person's role is. That in itself takes time. However, Mm -hmm. some of that knowledge can be very easily transmitted from unit to unit. I believe, um, shout out to Will Hardy for addressing that in an academic research paper. Although he was speaking in terms of building rapport and maintaining that rapport and sharing that knowledge with, with ourselves um, about our member, you know, about our partner nation, members of our partner nation, this would be in terms of doing the same thing, just knowing the culture of the unit coming in and the, to an extent means knowing a lot about their leaders. So let me just jump ahead because actually saying that makes me want to split out these two on that I have on building rapport and do a whole separate treatment of rapport building. Because what I'm trying to do is make an argument here for the leadership at MATA to look and see the benefit of, for, for, for example, an 18 hour minor can be accomplished in the course of a year with the way some of a, some online course loads are set up, right? And 18 hours worth of, of college level treatment in an anthropology subject, for example, you know, which will teach you about the custom, teach you a little bit more. You won't have a PhD level, a PhD level of understanding, right? But you will be a little bit better equipped to go to well, to go anywhere, frankly, and understand that people are different, right? Mm -hmm. Now, you won't quite have an anthropologist level, a PhD in anthropology level of understanding about a specific indigenous culture, 
right? But you'll at least appreciate a little bit more about their, you know, about their way of life, right? Those are the kind of, you know, the, the, that's the systematic way of thinking that I'm arguing that only an academic level treatment, and I literally mean sitting down in a classroom setting and spending some time studying the people that you're going to go and have to build rapport with, right? You will get a lot more out of a three-hour college course than you're going to get out of a zero-hour college course. <laughs> I'm not saying we can't be doing, you know, independent reading and study because all warriors should be scholars. You don't just sit in your barracks and, you know, read the art of war all day, right? Because, yeah, who does that, you know? No, we should be taking some time and studying the area of operations because it's only going to enhance our situational awareness. And it's not the same way I was trained as an infantryman where you know, we were still walking through the woods with camo, making sure the bad, you know, bad guys didn't get us before we got them. We need right. to do that. That's a skill set, right? But in the modern area, era, I'm sorry, in the modern era, the modern warrior has to be a different type of thinker. So that rapport building that you mentioned, building rapport with the host unit, that makes me want to give rapport building a whole different treatment because we have, it's our real world examples. I think that's going to offer this a little bit of not just, not just a little more power, but it's going to really put a face to it um, because you can learn the basis of some of these skills with a little bit of academic coursework. That, that academic coursework, again, I mean, obviously that's vital and that's part of what you're, you're talking about is how do you build this, how do you build this scholar, right? But when you hear these negative outputs that are culturally based, right? So-and-so is a basket case. Um, they, and then that gets put on that person, that, that, that host nation partner as well. So the team, their team basket case, right? So when you hear that, you need to stop because what's more important is to deal with that bad cultural situation and dive into that relationship vertically or horizontally or wherever that relationship is. Uh, for example, you and I were doing work and we happened upon a rule of law situation when we were talking to a judge and the perception was, and the briefing was at the unit level was this judge won't hear cases and he won't go out and get any cases to hear. Now there's a whole complex conversation to have here and I'm, I'm paraphrasing this so you can smash this into the ground. But we went and actually talked to the judge. This is that, that movement that's not vertical. It's not horizontal. This is tangential, right? But still critical. So now we're bringing in the rule of law expert for the brigade, who's an American, the judge, and then also the district chief of police and also the district governor. So all four of these elements are being engaged with this conversation. And then all of the American partners, which are way numerous, all looking at this in a negative light. So this judge says to Rich and I, judges don't go get cases. They're brought before me. If there are no cases to be brought before me, by the way, I don't have furniture and I don't have my gun that I've been promised. <laughs> if you're not going to bring cases before me, I'm here, I'm doing my job. It's not my job to bring cases. And so we wrote that down. And then the rule of law expert, the American, the lawyer, said, that's not, I didn't tell him he could have a gun, which clearly he had. And two, he'd somehow forgot how the judicial system works, at least in America. And so when a judge is able to say, hey, and, and it changed how we saw that, and more importantly, it changed how the commander saw it, and it improved the possibility that we could partner better with that judge. I'm going to shut up, Rich, and let you use that example. <laughs> well, the political scientist who was in that room with you and who helped gather, <laughs> helped gather some, helped make some, you and I made the observations together. You and I turned those observations into data points. And we took us, we, we, our systematic analysis told us that we had someone who was part of the formal government. And this was an area where the formal government wasn't really legitimate or seen as legitimate. And as a person who has spent a fair amount of his adult life studying power and where it comes from and how it's used, I was able to 
through much whiteboarding and conversations with you, <laughs> help push back on that on some of those assumptions that were made by that were made by ISAF elements, because we knew this guy didn't have the type of legitimate authority that people were going to perceive anyway. And yeah, like other than the you know the fact that he doesn't go out looking for cases, which is kind of absurd, he wasn't necessarily seen as the legitimate rule of law guy he wasn't the legitimate he wasn't the legitimate judge he was a gyroa judge and he wasn't necessarily uh i'm not going to say he wasn't welcome but you can get your problems dealt with a lot quicker and i don't know man this is frustrating to think about <laughs> you know <laughs> but because i'm trained to look at power and to understand power like part of this guy's problem was that he wasn't a religious leader you know and you and i had some other work that kind of helped to inform us about that but you know having an understanding of what power is in the first place and power may not always be a formal thing you know, so we're in the briefing room and all of these people are only really and by people, I mean, uh, I don't know, who do I mean by people, the people who were given the briefing and the people who were receiving the briefing, were only looking at power in one way. They were thinking about power as a formal thing that's written down in a book somewhere. And they were neglecting the fact that in the eyes of and in the, in the perceptions of the local population, this guy was not a, the religious leader who was in who was in their minds uh, the appropriate adjudicator of offenses. Is that, that, I mean, I know that's a long way around. A, well, a well we have barn, some more work but, to do. We have some more work to do. Okay, so in this case, we have a brigade commander who's got all these elements out there. He's got someone partnered with the State Department who's working on rule of law. That person's briefing that, and, and this is the, the, the importance of the advisory mission, right? You're going yeah. to, as the rule of law guy, you're yeah. briefing that you're doing your job. And if my partner, my judge, isn't hearing cases, there's only so much I can do. Yeah. Well, this is... If that's not... Hang on. Let me say one more thing. That's not going to get elevated to the boss's attention because it's really not that important. When it becomes important is when Rich and Pete sit down and say, hey, by the way, it's not that this guy is lazy or won't hear cases. He needs furniture in his courtroom unless they're going to sit on the floor. Right. And he said specifically, I need my furniture. I need yeah. my gun. <laughs> and nobody's bringing cases. Now we have this multi partner problem where, OK, well, now the question is, is why aren't cases being brought forward to the judge? Maybe he would maybe maybe he would hear them. But we have we have an earlier problem in the chain. But that all of that recognition and all of that partnering collaboration can never happen until Rich and Pete go and have that conversation and say, we've actually looked into rule of law. It's not broken. It's just not being engaged properly, and it's going to take the DCOP partner, the DGov partner, the PGov, the PCOP, all of these different people talking about how do we get cases through this Western thing, because otherwise, that whole system, that whole branch of the government and everything that ties into it, and this is right, I'm saying this to the commander, right? So the advisor is saying to the commander, this whole thing is fucked. We're losing the fight here. And there's no reason why we can't put energy here into this. If we can't talk amongst ourselves on how to test this system and get it to work, it will never work on the other end. So here we are trying to, and I'm I finally there now, here we are trying to build capacity, briefing that there is no capacity because of their failure. In reality, it's our failure as an organization to recognize. And a commander has the resources to say, change that, unfuck that, add more of this, and I'll get you money here. But they can't do it because it's never briefed that way because of a lack of cross partnering uh, between the different advisors internally. Well, but the advisor, first of all, I don't know. Let me get a bit smug here, Pete. If okay. only there was someone who had a Ph.D. in political science in the room <laughs> who could look at the commander and say, sir, but what about this? Uh -huh. If only if in, during this event. Right. So I hope that's smug enough for anybody out there. Uh, and everybody out there. But that's it's if, if you have a different level of understanding of the problem, you can actually say all the things you just said, which is, you know, that's this is a very frustrating conversation to have.
You know, I want to get angry. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if only you had a person who studied this thing and could help us understand it. And, you know, yeah. And, but also, there you go. It's, it's part of my argument for if you think about things in a more systematic manner. Right. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. in those briefings, it blows my mind. It's like we are still we're having this conversation, but no one's yet acknowledging the fact that the f you're, you're all we're doing is looking at formal power. Right. Right. And there are ways that we as we learn, there are ways to engage that formal mechanism. If you go through informal means, it takes time. Right. But we also came to this level of understanding because, you know. Well, we had an academic level understanding. We had a way of thinking about things systematically. You had a methodology based on your informal PhD in the field, right? Well, you know how to think about a problem systematically. You know how to think about those kind of problems systematically. That's all a PhD level understanding does for a person is you're generally trained to think in a more systematic manner. Ultimately, if you have a master's degree in a subject, you should be able to think about that thing in a much more systematic manner. Ideally, if you have an undergraduate degree, you should have the capacity to, right? So am I saying we need to get all, make sure all security advisors, I mean, I'm sorry, combat advisors have a degree? Yeah, you can get someone a degree in something. You can wipe the slate clean with academic training. You can either help a person understand how to think about a subject, but also how to think about thinking about that subject. You know, a lot of those people in that room didn't even know how to think about power outside of formal power that was given to this particular judge in this particular area of operations. And also you're dealing with a bunch of people who need to check off boxes and they don't necessarily have time to make sure those boxes don't get checked off. Why aren't people in the judge's office? Well, you haven't gotten him a chair, right? <laughs> Who was supposed to get him a desk? Yeah. You know, so interesting stuff. But and even if this guy doesn't need a gun, you know, and let's say that the uh, rule of law American advisor didn't actually promise that. Why does this guy feel like he needs a gun? Why does Rich have to slow down and say, it's not that he wasn't welcome, but, but he wasn't welcome. He wasn't from this tribe. He wasn't from this area. No. So again, as an advisor, it's easy to say, I'm advising this guy. I'm telling them what to do. But you're not understanding the infrastructure of the mind. So to do that, you have to have rapport. You have to have trust. Those things are testable. So if we're not going to understand the infrastructure of the mind, we're just going to put something and you're going to dominate that that uh, relationship, that advising relationship, and you're not going to get done simple things that have to be done before you get to that. You know, we heard the, the mantra of fill the task gill. Like, yeah, great. If you fill these billets, the government will work. That's wrong. That never works. You can't just put people in a billet because you create a hundred other problems. And if they even sit there and do their job, it's rife with corruption because we force the initiative without understanding the building blocks that are in place. So when you say this this academic system-based approach, absolutely. And understanding, and I think this is your third bullet, talking about stability versus instability. If we accept that, the rules of stability say, the third rule is you create more instability by your mere presence. And most things you do create instability. Then you can say, is this working? Are we working in the right area? Do we need to back up? Because this is delicate, deliberate work. Hey, this is Pete A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. Are we working in the right area? Do we need to back up? Because this is delicate, deliberate work. And, and, and do that. But that takes that academic mind you're talking about. Expand on that, please. Well, one thing to think about I'm, in my mind, and I've tried to, I've just started trying to draw this out in the paper. Sources of instability can come from many different domains of public interaction. That's a complicated way to say people don't get along all the time. <laughs> so, but it's often, I think, useful to know if the source of those grievances are 
grounded in economic inequality. Mm -hmm. uh, they may be grounded in political inequalities. They may be grounded in uh, social inequalities. But it's often useful to know um, where, where the source of those grievances might be, might be coming from, because then you can better address the problem. Now, it's not to say that those problems aren't necessarily overlapping, because they often are, right? And, and it can be difficult to disentangle them, right? But I think particularly, and, you know, this is why I saved the, uh, uh, what's my fourth one, uh, working with development initiatives for last, is because this is, in my mind, where it all kind of culminates, right? Because you, you've heard about my broader state building model agenda that U.S. foreign policy needs to be geared towards, but that's it, right? So I'm building up to that right there. Because at the end of the day, you're going to be often put in charge of making sure some kind of development initiative happens. And it could be building a church, building a, you know, or mosque, building a school, building a government building. It could be filling the damn tash kill. It could be making sure the judge has cases to hear, you know? Don't get me started about that judge, man. That That's still... Totally misunderstood, not, not understanding the problem. And we spent a lot of time in a briefing room when we could have been doing other things. So, but yeah, we often, we often don't understand what the sources of instability are. Um, and to put Especially up, when it's us. Yeah, it, well, especially when it's us. Um, the ISAF Shura. Everyone must attend the ISAF Shura. Little inside joke for the audience. If you get that one, you've listened to the show, maybe. Okay, so so when when you do look at these problem sets, and you start to understand that you're communicating spherically, and and these spheres intersect almost like a Venn diagram, but really it's not a Venn diagram. I want people to think of these problem sets as a, an Euler diagram, where there's several Venns and some things that overlap. And you, if you look at it from this problem set, like how does the peacock, the peacock, the chief of police for the province, how does that person impact this particular initiative? What role do they have in this case? The courtroom was at the Peacock's office, the provincial chief of police. So people would stack up. And, and because Rich and I could move around the battlefield, we would go to where the, the provincial chief of police was. And you would see 10 Afghan dudes lined up waiting to plead their case before him, right? So you take these disparate pieces of information that on our Euler diagram, they don't intersect. But because Rich and I can look and say, holy shit, these things need to intersect. Now you're nudging the peacock and the judge together. And the commander is like saying, yes, do more of that. You two partners start talking and let's start to figure out what it takes to get cases in front of this judge. Yeah. And, you know, having a little bit of knowledge of the history of an area goes a long way for this. Having a little bit of knowledge about how the legal system was working in an area of operations that that's that's the kind of level of understanding that i'm saying we can we can start to achieve now you may not have a phd anthropology in the judicial inner workings of um Shajoy in zabul province afghanistan you may not have that i mean there's there's probably an anthropologist out there who who has that that level of understanding about this stuff, but that's the kind of coursework I think we can be having the advisor go through. Um, you can't be in the field all the time, but you can be mentally in the field and you can use an academic, you can use an, a rigorous academic level treatment of a subject to get the combat advisor smarter on their area of operations. So they may not be wasting time, for example, um, not understanding that informal authority is the norm. We need to start fusing formal with the informal. There are actually ways to do that. We wrote a paper on it. Pretty neat. Go check it out. So, you know, there's some things that you can learn that just give you, that I think can enhance the advisor's situational awareness, right? And I'm thinking, so we, we could talk all day about instability, but also think about sources of stability. And when I was when I was outlining this paper, it made me think about your, uh, and I'm probably going to say it wrong, but your Stefan is it Stefan Arch? Stefan Arch, yes. Yeah, you know, I mean, we we just we we talked about that a bit uh, at the NATO conference a few months ago. You know, that's a source of stability that, with a little bit of knowledge of history, 
uh, archaeological history, art, um, local economies, right? How they how they how they have operated historically, um, and a little bit of knowledge of some of the elements of religion, some of the elements of Islam that we talked about um, in that paper. Then you might be able to, as a combat advisor, either you know do it yourself or let the chain of command know that you've got a potential source of stability here you're not leveraging that could be leveraged in such a way that you're actually promoting the kind of security that's going to lead to a longer term stability okay so let's so we've established this link between education and understanding systems and thinking about how for example power flows there must be other things that we can understand but we'll give that as a granted and maybe come back to that so understanding how powers work i definitely think about how the system works the commander has their their four line mission statement and one of them is to teach and train the local the local authorities government whatever it is and so when you and I go out into the field and we talk to the level below that, we talk to the populace, and I will say this out loud and record it again, the civil populace is the center of gravity in modern conflict. So if you can't find a connection, a positive connection towards the government, you know, as an advisor, right? If you don't see people, if you're advising a, uh, the local border patrol captain on how to do their job better, and you never see locals engaging that person in their office, you now have a place where you, it's fertile ground to, to develop that. How do you, Captain, get people to come here and, and bring up problems or alert us or talk to us more? And even if it's happening a little bit, how do you increase that? What, what do we do to get the population to understand that you exist, that you do your job every day and, and how hard you do it? So understanding those flows of information of power is, is vital and I, I actually, I want to add this too, slightly tangential, but I want to get back to this. The, the book I, I suggest everybody reads is Benedict A. Grima's Ethnography Notes from the Field, because it teaches you that you have no fucking idea what you're getting into when you go into these foreign places. And even it doesn't matter where you're going. Her book is valuable because it gives you the proper frame of mind on something you would never know anything about and how complex life can be culturally. So back to the original point. Without these kind of books in your quiver that you've got a mastery of, like Robin Dreek's books on trust and predicting human behavior. He's a retired counterintelligence agent from the FBI. This guy knows how to build trust. If you're going to go somewhere and build rapport, which is first point, um, you have to have a mastery of these books. So what does a course program look like so you can have an anytime, anywhere, any fight kind of tool set so you can see power and communication and outputs and how they flow through a system well you you brought up benedict grima and i'm glad you did i mean she's one of the names mentioned in my book i mean we're talking about someone who's devoted her academic career to understanding people and customs uh, and her particular area of operations was in afghanistan and she i wish i had read her book before i deployed you know and i read a lot of books but her work with with people in in Afghanistan really helped give me an insight after the fact um, when I was implementing this kind of stuff into my scholarship. You can learn a lot about your a lot about where you're going to go work in. You know the area that you're going to be working. These advisors are going to be attached to. I mean, we got how many commands have we split up the world into? You know where you're going. You can do some macro level cultural training for example and learn about you know teach a course in islam i mean seriously if you're going to go to an islamic country please do more than read a book on islam you know take some like rigorous academic coursework that teaches you how to think about islam in a systematic manner much in the same way as scholars treat christianity or any of the other major faith traditions you know so once you start learning how to treat a broader subject in a systematic manner, I think you can become, and again, I'll, I'll use this I'll use this concept, I think you can enhance your situational awareness, right? Now, obviously doing some homework on Islam is great, but go and do some homework again on Afghanistan. Figure out a little bit about their history. Understand why this place has an informal power structure more than it has a formal power structure in the first place, right? So you can 
kind of transition your way into a more finely tuned knowledge base about where you're going to go work or well you can do that and all advisors should be doing that but we can also i think train advisors how to develop their own dossier if you will on a place where they're going to go work and i think that what i'm doing here is just i want to use this paper to try to just develop a set of broad based attributes that an advisor could, should really have in their toolkit I don't think every advisor is going to have going to be able to look at the commander and say, sir, the power structure here is works through an informal means and everything that everybody just said in this briefing is a waste of time. But I mean, hey, it's nice to have somebody on the team with a PhD in that particular thing, be it uh -huh. some, I don't know, some like, are you the smartest guy in the room on the agriculture in this area? Wouldn't that be helpful? to have a guy who knows how to do that. Wouldn't it be nice to have a guy in the room who's, hey, are you the smartest guy who knows as much as you can on how to develop safe water filtration systems naturally in this part of the world, right? Because it would be nice to have, I mean, who does that kind of work? Civil engineers? I don't know, yeah. right? Yeah. So you have, you have skill sets within academia, right? You can have, I mean, you can have a team of people who have a different academic skill set in addition to whatever their occupational specialty is. But we can use and we can fuse academic coursework. And again, I go back to it's not just about the topics that you learn when you take a college class the courses that you take in route to getting a, an undergraduate degree, then you might go on and get a master's level training in something, you know, PhD level training is why I can look at the commander and say that everyone's wasting his time, right? With confidence, because I understand not only what's happening with military culture in the room, but, you know, I went with my PhD in field work buddy, Pete Turner, and we went and talked to people about this. And as it turns out, you know, you got two PhDs in the room and you got a PhD in what you do. You know, I've given you an honorary degree, which Thank is you. why we were able to operate so effectively, you know, but without that. And, and, and all I'm I mean, what I'm really saying to the audience is we've got the ability to think about things systematically because we've been trained to think about things in a very systematic manner. Right. You think about things very systematically. I've, I know I've. I've been with you in the field, right? Our best work was when we got together and kind of fused the two things, right? And and it's, you know, with confidence, I can look at the commander and say, these guys are wasting your time, sir. Let's, let's back up to Benedicte's book because you talked about it in terms of how regionally important it was, but I think that book defies region in a lot of ways because it yeah, gives a mindset because yeah. having specific knowledge of an area is important. And I also want to follow this up with the tabula rasa concept because having her book in your quiver, no matter where you go, will enable you to see the system, the social system, how complex these things are, no matter where you go. So, one of the things that she communicates is, is, you know, how women and men interact and the importance of certain social uh, events, weddings, those kind of things are for that environment. So if you want to understand what it's like to live in the Congo or whatever, you know, Benedicte Grima's Secrets from the Field, that whole ethnography she does, it will teach you how complex it is in that area that where she was at and then how you culturally progress deeper into that environment you can use those tools anywhere you go rich right so so i want to talk a little bit about the universality of a book like that and then how to again see the power see how the norms flow culturally it's one thing to get a smart card and say hey don't use the thumb gesture in this country but if that's the level you're playing at you need to not deploy because you're combat ineffective and you're going to screw these things up. So let's talk about the universality of some of these of books that are out there and then also get into the, the cultural aspects and how we can feed our brains culturally so that regardless of the culture, I don't need a smart card. I can go anywhere in the world now because I have that PhD yeah. in the field. Yeah. I don't need you to tell me how to offend somebody. And you can't think of culture as a way of preventing offense. You think of culture as a way of accomplishing your goal 
through their smooth, established, normal cultural path. And if you think about that with culture, now you have a chance to do it. So let's talk about the book and then about how it leads into our cultural ability to get jobs done. Because the cultural line of effort is way better than whatever line of effort the commander comes up with. Well, she is an ethnographer, you know, so she went and lived amongst Pashtun people. And, you know, as a woman, that meant she was, she had to learn the code of women in, in that culture, you know, and that's, I think just reading about her experiences. I mean, she had to, she had to navigate all of the unwritten unspoken rules of being a woman in Northwest Pakistan, Southern Afghanistan. And she accomplished this in two weeks, right? Oh yeah. Two weeks. She went in, banked it out, did her paper copy survey, uh, got a bunch, got a, got a large sample size and written, ran some numbers. And yes, the task kills being filled, right? Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, she spent, she spent, I don't know. I mean, from the back cover I'm reading, she lived and worked among the uh, Pakistani Pashtuns and Afghan refugees uh, for 10 years. You know, she went and lived amongst these people for 10 years and she didn't just like pack up one day and decide to go there. She had to teach herself a few things before she did that. Right now you really want her on your team. If you're working in, you know, Zabul province, Afghanistan, and you're trying to understand, for example, how to get books distributed amongst the local population for this reading literacy initiative that you have, you really want her on your team, right? Because she can help you understand the ins and outs of how to, how women live in this type of environment, you know, so that if you're going to implement this develop initiative, that you're doing it in the most culturally appropriate manner. It would be nice to have a Benedict Grima on your team. You don't always get that, right? But you got to have someone or you got to have the advisor who's able to step back and look at things essentially from the, the local population's perspective and develop an understanding of how those people will receive whatever development initiatives that you might be trying to implement, you know? And I bring up the radio literacy program and, and our, you know, awesome, let's, help people learn how to read over the radio because, you know, it takes someone who's looked at the problem systematically to understand that, you know, there are proper ways that you could implement such initiatives, but you got to look at the, you got to look at what you're doing from the population's perspective and an ethnographer, someone who's not from the culture and has learned from an academic perspective, how to immerse themselves in another culture in order to literally put themselves in the shoes of those people. I mean, that takes decades. That's not something you achieve overnight, but why not developing, I don't know, a few academic courses where you uh, teach people how to not just appreciate what she's done here, but learn what it is in the first place. Because learning what it is, is what will help you once you get to the field, right? You can teach someone how to, how to learn in the field. I think, I would like to think in the time that you and I spent together, you taught me a lot how to learn from what you knew how to do. And I would like to think that, well, in part, because I repeat myself a lot, that I helped you <laughs> understand things from what I was trained in. All right. Yeah. And, and, that, and that's for sure. That definitely happened. Uh, let's, because there's a couple of things, again, I want to dive into here because this is the part of the education. I want to back way back and say, okay, again, I have an education. I'm already getting another degree. Uh, I'm published, you know, I want to be these things. Tell me specifically why what you're talking about is different. How, how do we, how do we bolster ourselves and prepare ourselves so that no matter where we go in the world, right? Okay, great. I, I've, I've got the foreign language capacity of Korean. I'm a four, four in Korean across the board. Um, by the way, I'm now in Africa and there's not a fucking Korean in sight who's not an American. So you know, these, these universal traits, how do you build this? Even if you don't have, you don't have access to a minor from Troy or whatever, like you just want to build your own program. What kind of things are you studying? Well, I definitely wouldn't spend any time learning Mandarin if you're gonna, you know, go work in Paris. 
you know, unless you're going to work for a Chinese company that's stationed in Paris, uh, you might want to learn French, you know, before you try to go work in France. But, um, you know, so the language bit, I don't know if I'd be focusing on language unless you really know where you, where you're going to be going, you know, so that's, I think at least my biggest point against anyone who says the advisor needs language training. Yes, the advisor needs, the advisor needs language training, but, you know, don't give them language training and send them somewhere else. You know, don't, don't waste time or give someone language training and keep them there. Keep them as an asset in that thing. Right. And that, I mean, that's a human, that's a human resources problem, you know, but at the same time, right. What could you be, you know, you already got a degree. What could you be learning? Well, you could learn a little bit about the fundamentals of language. You know, that's stuff you can be learning in a classroom, right? You can learn a little bit about linguistics, you know, something that's been written about how the language of that specific area that you're going to. But again, this is why I think the academic model, which is delivering the coursework in a systematic manner, right? So it's typically read a book, have a discussion, write a paper, you know, but I mean, finding reading material, Benedict Grimes book, for example, in a section of an anthropology class that deals with not even just dealing with postune people, but dealing about, for example, gender and gender identity and how gender identity is translated or into power or not. Right. This is the kind of thing that's transferable across cultures, understanding how, for example, different types of identity genders. One, um, you and I have done a little work on religion, the religious identity component, you know. So what can you be learning? You've already got a degree. Well, you could still be learning how to think systematically about a different culture. And if you can, going back to you know, some of the sources of grievances, some of the sources of stability and instability, understanding whether or not the problem is indeed rooted in the political climate, or it's indeed, you know, a recent fluctuation in market activity that's less that's left some members of a tribe at odds with another members of another tribe, right? That's not a large scale political problem. That may just be a matter of, you know, somebody built a dam and in the wrong place and somebody's almond trees got too much water. I don't know, you know, but understanding a little bit about some of these power structures and power dynamics across a range of human activity, understanding problems that way, I think comes from or comes from a systematic treatment of a subject, you know. So and I know I keep I'm just saying we need to take more college classes, but I'm also saying that what coursework does, what academic curriculum does is teaches you how to think systematically you know it teaches you how to understanding what the standards are in a field of study okay you know, i think that writes right there in itself so understanding what the standards are in a field of study that's what you could be doing okay let's let's go back now and talk about the tabla rasa concept now too because you can come in you're prepared you've read all the the, the country studies You've got your IPB brief, your intelligence preparation to the battlefield brief, um, and you come to this new place. First off, Benedict de Grima informs us that it takes more than two weeks to build rapport and establish cultural norms, right? This is not stuff done off a smart card. Maybe you're going to do it faster than Benedict de. Maybe she's doing it at a level that you don't need to reach. But this shit takes time, right? So we know that we have to build something that might take, and I, I know I'm excellent at this, right? You've seen me work in the field. It took me six months to build a reliable, provable trust with a partner who then opened the floodgates and introduced us to tons of people that no one else was engaging and revealed all things, I don't know, a thousand things that the military had no idea about, about that local area, right? So taking the time, and understanding that these things take time is one of the lessons you should learn from Benedicte's book, but also from the cultural side of things. This stuff isn't done in a microwave. And the other thing I wanted to say about this is when you look at the system-based approach, and if you did you know, study how do we look at things system-wise, the tabla rasa concept forces you to say, we are part of the system. This is your back to your stability versus instability element. You know, We are part of the system. Can we improve our performance by 
10%. And that 10% is notional, whatever, you know, whatever that is. Are we causing more problems than we are creating? And I'm going to tell you right now, from my PhD in the field that Rich has granted me, uh, we are always the place where the most improvement can be done most quickly because we're not prepared. We've fired, you know, mortar pieces uh, in, in pre-deployment training. So our capacity absolutely impacts the, our nation, our partnered nation's uh, ability to receive the lesson from us. And then if that lesson is taught, and uh, let's say we're teaching our lessons at a 25% capacity because we're not prepared to do it, what is their ability to reliably retain and, and develop that capacity? It's some number south of 25%. So I'm going to shut up and get out of your way because I know you have things you want to say about this. <laughs> well, it does take time, and there's a problem with that, right? Because we don't really want to we got a hard time and this is not the, not the army's fault. Um, this is a political problem here in, in our country. There's nobody wants to set the time. Let's devote the time. We'll throw money at a problem, but our, how much time are we really going to devote to this? You know, cause we could be nice to go back and have a redo in, a, in Afghanistan. Right. But right. Hey, check this out. It takes time, but I don't know what to tell you as you know, Hey advisors, here's a piece of advice. Um, about what you should do. But I could, given the fact that we're dealing with the constraints of time, because I try to deal with this in the paper. One thing you can, you, you could, you can attempt to not do is something that is going to just be seen as a massive waste of time. Something mm. that's just going to be seen as a massive fuck up, you know, um, and maybe not even a massive fuck up, mm -hmm. but when you're, when you are, tasked with looking for ways to improve the market activity in your area of operations, maybe do a little bit of homework on how agriculture is actually done in that area and learn a little bit about, for example, where you should and should not put um, a collection center for agriculture, you know? So I've, would you like, you, you got any reflections on the agriculture centers, the collection well, centers? How about uh, we, you know, yeah, yeah. don't leave behind a massive waste of time. It wasn't massive, but this is just a little thing strung out along the highway that because we didn't do a little bit of homework, a little bit of history, actually. But at the country scale, it is a massive problem because here's what bad partnering yes. looks like. When you show up in someone's office and you say these words out loud, and if nothing else gets across from all these shows... If you're going to partner with someone, regardless if you're in the military or not, if you say the words, my boss wants to do this, therefore we will do it, and you pick a spot where a collection center is going to go, I'll be damned, you'll put it there, and then when you leave, that collection center will get photographed by Rich and I, and we'll say, hey, what's this thing? And they'll say, it's some dumb thing the Americans built. We use it as a bus stop. <laughs> we use it as, you know, a place to store our weed, you know, whatever it is. It won't get done the right way. It's a huge missed opportunity because you as this, and this is, again, this is that you studying our impact. We force the forcing actions where we dominate the conversation and dominate the partnership and say, this will be done. Instead of saying, that's a goal. It's going to be a big goal for the entire thing. What, what if you turned to your partner and said, what's on your agenda? What are you trying to do? Can I put a couple of initiatives in that my boss wants to do? Can we talk about where you have space for me to help you and where you don't need my help so I can get out of your way? Uh, and, and this is whether you're teaching how to use basic firearms, you know, map reading or anything else, like understand what's available with your partner. That's good partnering. So we don't do that. And so when we come in as advisors for agriculture, we don't know the, 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 the food chain from grower to market in that region and we don't even consider that that matters we just come in and start fucking with it which is an actual thing that we do the adts were the adts were one of the biggest sources of instability because they did they never partnered well and it's not a hit on them individually it's a hit on the organization these are the reasons why we're having these conversations because it was needless waste and opportunities missed in so many areas where you could have the have the governor Say, hey, uh, if you're into this, this is what we'd like to do. He says, yes. Okay, can you make call a meeting with the elders? And let's see how many different sub-districts we can get represented, how many hamlets we can get here. Let's count that and assess that connection to the government. And then say to them, the Americans are suggesting that we put in this collection center as a way to improve our ability for farmers to bring money from their crops. 
Now, keep in mind, they don't want to do this because they already have a system that exists and you're fucking with it without knowing about it. But that's how you have a chance of taking a shitty situation where you're going to get a loss and turn it into a possible win because you've got elders consuming the government and making decisions together. And then you, when they say, we don't want to do it, you go back to your boss and say, only room for one sword in the scabbard, boss. We're not doing this one. They've said no. Yeah, and you know, there's actually, you can teach a person... I think the combat advisor can be taught the skills or should be taught the skills if they don't already have them to be able to go to an area of operations and do that very thing, figure it out. But the combat right. advisor also should be able to have the ability to go to the library and learn a little bit about that thing, to, which will make it easier to figure it out. And you might learn that, you know, using the example we're using is in Zabul province. And you might learn, for example, that there's a lot of variation in how the vendor gets the product from the producer in terms of the grossies. And there are some relationships. I mean, Benedict Grima level understanding is, you know, living in the area for such an amount of time that she knows the names of the vendors and the growers. She knows which how long they've been, you know, the vendor's been buying from the same grower, right? You don't necessarily need that level of understanding, but it might be help. It might be helpful to know that some of these vendors, they would not use a collection center in the first place because they like to go and see where the product was planted. <laughs> they like, they want to see, they want to see what these trees look like before they buy some pomegranates. Right. And they're not going to buy your pomegranates if they're sitting underneath a hot tin shack. And because that's not how they do agriculture around here. But that might be different from the way they do agriculture 30 miles away in a bigger market. Right. So you put that collection center there. And now, you know, you basically gave the locals. Sure, they use it. They use it as a taxi stand. But uh, at the same time, it's just another example of look what the army gave us something we didn't want, or they put it in the wrong place because they didn't ask us, you know? So it's those, those are simple things, right? But by understanding or being able to go, go to Mizan and ask the question, is this collection center going to work right. here? You know, right. like knowing how to ask that question in the first place, right? There's a way you can shape a person's mind to enter into an area, you know, again, blank slate, mm -hmm. blank slate and say, well, wait a minute. We got some development money here. Somebody wants to build a collection center like the one down the road. You know, should we do that? That yeah. should be your first question, right? And that's a question for your partner, if yeah. he's the governor, or if you're if you're help, trying to help out cross cross partnering style. You go to the uh, the DCOP and you say, "Hey, there's some agricultural initiatives." You know, what do you think? Who do we talk to about that? And then you ask these questions and that's how you partner. I, yeah. I don't want to go too much further because we're already past an hour, but talk briefly about how Tabla Rasa will help someone who's in the field and the academic value of that concept. Well, it's that, I mean, I'll, I'll go back to the example we just gave, you know, or we were just talking about with the, with this, these collection centers, you know, the blank slate is going to Mizan and realizing that you know, there's a good possibility because you've learned this, you could learn these kind of things in a textbook. Historically, the market activity around this particular good and, you know, scholars have figured these things out and scholars have given students through textbooks a way to understand how to think about these things, right? So the blank slate is coming in and understanding that, you know, that these collection centers, they might work one place, but maybe they work differently here. But you've already known that the market activity in this particular area isn't necessarily the same as it is in another particular area. But just understanding that, you know, informal means of communication, informal networks, um, this is part of the history, the local culture, the local custom. A lot of it's tied to family. A lot of it's tied to history and heritage. But understanding that you can teach a person how to operate in that kind of environment, but essentially learn while they're there, right? You can teach a baseline. You can teach a person or give a person a baseline level of skills in a particular academic discipline that will help them approach any of these situations that they might be put in as an advisor, if they involve rapport building, if they involve understanding 
sources of stability and instability, uh, but also understanding a little bit more about the context in what's development initiatives might be implemented. Let me take that and see if I can say it in a different way, just to provide another point of view on how to, because it's, it's a complicated concept. Yes, learn about the culture. Yes, learn about language. Yes, learn about the region. Yes, get a back brief from the partner ahead of you. You know, do all of these things and have them as a baseline of knowledge. And let's say your resolution of, of your situation in your job is some number less than 100%, probably a number less than 50%. Wiping the slate clean, having that information to arm you, to prepare you is great. And wipe the slate clean and go, now I need to go find out what's really going on. Use what I've learned. And this is where my system worked. It didn't matter where I went at some point. I don't need a cultural brief. I don't need a language brief. I just need a language asset and I will take care of the rest because I've built the tools so that I'm ready, ready to go no matter where I go. The ultimate partner is that. Anytime, any fight, anywhere, it doesn't matter. I am always ready because once I get there, I wipe the slate clean and I start with step one. And I do step one properly and I don't go to step 27. I have rapport, right? I, I slowly craft these things so that in the first three months, six months, my 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 personal relationship with this person is such that I now have uncommon access and I am now learning the unknown unknowns and, and accomplishing things through partnership that aren't possible in any of my other connected partnership relationships. Yeah. And I think, I guess one way to re- like, cause I know I, I, I say a whole, I try to say a whole lot anyway, and I think I succeed. I'm real mouthy, you know, I'm a professor. I get paid to talk. So I think that the academic approach I'm advocating for might help in terms of, you know, setting the advice or helping the advisor set for themselves their left and right limits Mm -hmm. on that tabula rasa blackboard, right? Because you're going to have to learn in the field. There's, there's something because you, you don't have time to back up and gain and, you know, go live amongst the Pashtun people for 10 years, you know, as a woman, and then all of a sudden, you know, be blessed with the um, detail of go run the FET teams, you know, that's not going to happen, you know, but what you can be taught is a little bit about, you know, I go back like local custom and culture, you know, religion, history, you know, all of the things that you can learn from a book to give yourself a better feel of what your left and right limits might be in any particular area that you're operating. Anything you want to say in closing, man? Anything else you want to add to this? This is a, a big, heady, and very complicated conversation. If uh, if you're interested in following up, asking questions, you can get a hold of me, Pete, at breakitdownshow.com, and I'll connect you to Rich. You should not understand everything we talked about. You should not feel like, yeah, I've got these tools in my shed already. I'm ready to go. And if you do think that, that's the problem. Most of us who do this work a lot are like, I don't know the first fucking thing. I try to explain it as best I can, but this stuff is complicated, and it's delicate, and it's your the whole path is fraught with errors. So Understand you're supposed to get this stuff wrong, but you're learning as you go and you're constantly adding to your, your skill set as you make these mistakes. Rich, anything in closing? Yeah, everybody in the audience, give me a break. Give me a break, Pete. I appreciate you not pushing me too hard. I'm so tired right now. <laughs> yeah, so if I'm a little slow and sluggish, that's why. This paper that I'm working on is a work in progress, and I would like to use it to start a discussion with other scholars because if this is not a good template, I don't want to be, I don't want to be working on it anymore. I want to come up with another way to try to help create a warrior scholar for the purposes of advancing the mission of the military advisor training Academy. And and also the standard caveat applies to, we love what you guys are doing. It's exceptionally hard. We respect the hell out of you for doing it. We've made all of the mistakes already. I'm, I'm telling you, I really have. Uh, so when you hear our, our tone, take it because we know you can take it. We've, we've been there. We've done it. We've built the systems. These things work, and that's why we illustrate these things. And, and when Rich says you need an education, in addition to what you have, you yeah. have to continue to learn, continue to add books. 
I'm not frustrated with you. I'm frustrated with the policies, damn it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The institution, that's what we want to get better, be able to get the institution to do better. And then as we add these really platinum books, you know, the books like by Benedicte, uh, Robin Dreek's books on building trust and rapport, these are the books that allow you to be not specifically or regionally great. They allow you the potential to become great at this job no matter where you go. So look for these books and just start to master them. Don't read them. Master them. We have episodes of Robin Dreek. Uh, I can't find Benedict A. Grimea to talk to, but one day maybe I'll get her on the show. But these folks are available for mentoring. You should know David Livermore's books on culture. Because if you don't, you're looking at a smart card, you're fucking wrong. You know, that's that's 10 level shit. You need to be working at a higher level and working on getting to that level if you're not there. Anyhow, thanks everybody for listening. These are real powerful episodes. And if you aren't in the SFAB world, thanks again for listening. Hopefully you were fascinated.